Hi, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to Bees Please, a guide to creating habitat for native pollinators with NYC urban park ranger Ashley Whited. We're so thrilled to have everyone here today for Earth Week with Green Thumb. My name is Mara Gittleman. I am the workshops and education coordinator for NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the office of the New York City Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. And my colleagues, Ijendu Obasi and Elena Dubas, are there on the other side of the camera at the garden live streaming today. So thanks guys for doing that. Um, and thank you so much to the amazing gardeners at Hope the Friendly Garden on the Hill on 152nd Street in Manhattan for hosting us today. This week for Earth Week, we are holding a series of webinars uplifting the ecological benefits of um, native plants and pollinators in community gardens. We are recording today's webinar and we'll make it available on our website and YouTube along with all of the other webinars in this series and from the past year. I will put links in the chat so you can check out our past webinars as well. We'll have the recording focused on the facilitator, but you're welcome to decide whether or not your camera is on using the little camcorder icon at the bottom of your screen. Thanks again, everyone, so much for being here today. And without further ado, I pass the mic to Ashley. Thank you so much, Mara. I am, um, and again, I just like to echo that, uh, that appreciation and thank you all for choosing to spend your time here with us today in this beautiful garden. Um, uh, as she said, my name is Ashley. I am an urban park ranger with the NYC or New York City uh, Parks and Recreation Department, our Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, for those of you who have not been on an urban park ranger program uh, or have not seen an urban park ranger in the city of New York, uh, we um, have kind of like three foci with our job or three things that we really um, focus on. Uh, one of them being exactly what we're doing today, uh, education. So connecting New Yorkers to their green spaces around them through wildlife management, through active recreation, uh, through history and through um, uh, wildlife, or, uh, sorry, green space integration. So um, we talk about different subjects varying from ecology to anthropology to history, uh, whatever it is that inspires the ranger and whatever it is that inspires New Yorkers to really come out and explore the green spaces around you. Um, another focus on our job uh, is animal condition. So if you're ever in a New York City uh, park and you see an injured animal or maybe something that looks a little bit, uh, please call 311. We also work very closely with our wildlife unit uh, that monitors and um, will track uh, conditions or concerns relating to wildlife. And we will be dispatched to those situations. So we'll go say there's a, a kind of a raccoon that's out during the day, um, we go and check and see if it is actually normal, healthy behaviors because raccoons do walk up in the day. Uh, they go and get their um, midnight snack or how we kind of like a midnight snack around midnight, uh, what that would equate to them. So around noon or in the daytime, they go and get food and water and then go back up and be sleeping. So we would go to that situation and assess and see what the proper action is. If it's healthy and good, we leave it in the park. And if not, we work very closely with organizations or rehabilitators in the city uh, to make sure that our wildlife can get the care that it needs to uh, be returned so that it may thrive and survive out in the park where it belongs or in the wild area it belongs. Uh, the last uh, kind of foci of our job is, uh, is enforcement. So it's our job to help make sure that um, not only the wildlife and the natural features of our areas are safe and that they're protected, but also that the people uh, in the parks are protected as well. We want to make sure that these uh, environments are inviting for all and that you have, you feel inspired to explore your curiosity um, and find your next, uh, your next love or your next passion in one of our New York City parks. So. Uh, our topic today uh, was related to the native pollinators. Now, native uh, our pollinators is a very broad spectrum word um, because a lot of different creatures are pollinators, from birds to wasps to ladybugs to um, to the very creatures that we're going to be talking about today, solitary bees. Um, uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on is our uh, solitary bees, which are a little different than uh, you know um, honey bees. Uh, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, the reason why we're focusing on solitary bees is because they are hardworking uh, pollinators that can be easily integrated into a high traffic space or um, a, a space with a lot of people without a lot 
lot of maintenance and without a lot of fear for you know um, any kind of stings or or uh, just uh, my apologies or with any fear of um, you know negative interactions or it's very limited so uh, and then is that still oh it fell out Oops. okay thank you oh uh, so what we're gonna do um, I apologize folks I'm gonna shift my mask or take my mask off so it's a little easier and as I said we are socially distant so Thank you so much for your patience and for these adjustments, or as I adjust. All right, we're gonna see if we can keep on going with that then. And I will just like this one here. Perfect, so, <laughs> solitary bees. Um, in our lesson today, or in our program today, we're gonna be focusing on a couple uh, different topics. Uh, so one, why solitary bees? Um, Two, creating a habitat for them, and uh, probably the most important part about it is maintaining that space. So not only giving them somewhere where they can, uh, you know, do the things they do, have the energy, have the food and resources, but making sure that we are instilling the uh, the, the longevity of them and the, uh, the the maintenance of them, the survivability of them, um, as well as, uh, and that includes for maintaining the houses that we're going to be talking about. Um, as well as you know, having the plants in the garden area that is will be you know preferred for them, or that will actually allow them the opportunity to, to take off and have reoccurring broods or reoccurring generations in your garden. Um, so why mason bees or why solitary bees? Uh, I was first introduced to mason bees, and, and when I say solitary bees, we're actually going to be talking about the family uh, Megacolidae, uh, and we're going to be focusing on two genuses in there. Are two types of bees in there which are going to be leaf cutter bees and mason bees. Um, I was first introduced to mason bees when I was living in Portland, Oregon and there was a free workshop about uh, you know beekeeping and like most folks or like a lot of folks I kind of assumed that it was you know honeybees. They're these like mega or charismatic uh, species so when you think of bees the first thing you think of is honeybees. So I went there thinking it was gonna be more along the lines of that but I was introduced to this amazingly tiny, fuzzy little creature with like this greenish, bluish hue called the orchid mason bee. Um, and orchid mason bees, they are effective pollinators, and mason bees in general, because uh, unlike honeybees or a lot of other bees, they, they don't carry, you know, wet packed pollen on their hind legs. Uh, they carry it on their big fluffy bellies, uh, or on their big hairy bellies, I should say that uh, when they are traveling to different flowers and different plants, they kind of do this very effective but silly little belly flop onto the flower and they gather up dry, loose pollen and cross pollinate that to uh, whatever flower that they next land on. So they're, while you know, one honeybee um, may surround a larger area, uh, one mason bee or leaf cutter bee, depending on the species, can pollinate six to 15 times more flowers than a honeybee. Um, now, solitary bees, or uh, my apologies, mason bees are solitary bees. So when we think of honeybees, we think of, you know, a, a large hive um, uh, that, uh, you know, has one queen and all the drones and all the workers uh, going out to make sure that that system is maintained and that it thrives. Uh, however, solitary bees, uh, each female bee is her own queen. She is fertile and she is able to create her own brood. Uh, so solitary bees, since they don't have this hive mentality, um, they're less likely to go into kind of like a pheromonal frenzy. So if they, if one bee feels uh, uh, threatened, um, another, there's no swarming activity. Um, and for this, and since they're solitary bees, uh, mason bees, leaf cutter bees, uh, solitary bees in general, they're extremely docile. Uh, so while in this workshop, I was able to actually hold a mason bee in my hand and have it, uh, you know, crawl around with little to no fear of it actually stinging me. And according to the Lewis County Bee Association, there's no, if they do sting, um, which again, they're very less likely to, uh, but according to the, the Lewis County Bee Association, if they do sting, there's no known record of an allergic reaction to a solitary bee sting. Now, that's not to say that it won't happen or that it can't happen, but it's far from common, um, unlike uh, some, you know, the fear that we may have of honeybee stings, which, you know, can cause anaphylaxis. Uh, so when deciding which bees to keep, solitary bees can be um, 
a much easier integration into a highly populated area or into a garden that has a lot of folks going in and out with a uh, little fear of stings in the first place and also uh, allergic reaction to those stings. Um, so not only are they extremely, uh, extremely docile and gentle creatures, uh, not only are they hard workers, uh, but they are, um, they're efficient workers. So as adults, mason bees probably uh, live around four to six weeks uh, as their adult life cycle. So in that time, they are constantly going out to, uh, you know, pollinate and grab the food that they need for their eggs um, and creating or bringing that food back to their nesting tubes uh, to, so that they may lay uh, the eggs you know, needed to create the next generation. So one bee can, will have a brood of about five to six, or I'm sorry, four to six uh, uh, eggs. Um, so they're putting in long hours. Uh, they are early pollinators. A lot of bees will come out during the summertime. So we're going to be talking about mason bees right now. They are early risers. So come, depending on the region you're in, here specifically in New York City, uh, come, you know, April, uh, March, we will actually start to see these uh, mason bees rise and start to pollinate a lot of our flowers. So we're going to be talking about uh, flowers that you can have that will actually, that will uh, help support our early risers, our early uh, emergers, I should say, um, as well as flowers to have throughout the season to protect and uh, sustain other solitary bees. Um, so now that I hope that I have you a little beholden to the idea of uh, keeping some solitary bees, uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, a really quick, low, easy, or I'm sorry, low maintenance and easy way to make your first Mason Bee Hotel or Mason Bee House. Um, and I really want to stress this idea of incremental installation. Now, even if you go to, you know, your local garden, your your community garden where you act, are actively volunteer, where you have a plot, and you go to them with this idea of having a Mason Bee Hotel, some folks might, you know, they, they still might want a trial era. So we are going to uh, kind of give you uh, the basis to uh, create that trial, uh, that trial hotel. So you can do this uh, by having everyday items around your, around your apartment or your home. Um, and we're gonna talk about, so in this trial one, where it's, or this low, this pilot uh, hotel, if you will, we'll be talking about, you know, a very basic way of maintaining it. And then moving on to other styles that you can buy for very low cost, anywhere from, you know, 10 to $35 and actually showing off one of the, uh, the hotels that are at, at this garden here um, and talking about the different ways to maintain it, the best practices in doing so. And, uh, and, and seeing what questions that might arise. So for our pilot B Hotel, a couple everyday household items that I have here with me is, I'm gonna splay them out because uh, we do have a little wind here right now. It's you know, typical wind or a spring here in New York City. But with every house, you need a structure. You need something that's going to case it and keep it safe. So right now I have just a water bottle that I cut the top off of. Um, and for demonstration purposes, this is great, uh, but for this structure, you actually want it to be a little bit deeper. The tubes or reeds itself ideally should be about four to, or I'm sorry, uh, six to eight inches. So you want the structure that those tubes or reeds uh, will be housed in to be a little bit longer. So that way that they can be protected from the elements like wind, rain, weather, um, and their and another important part is that there's only one entrance. Uh, so that will also apply to the reeds that we're going to be installing. But mason bees, uh, if they see an exit or, you know, another light from the end of the, t uh, the tube or reed, they're not going to feel safe and they're not going to uh, set up their cells or lay their eggs there. So like I said, for my structure, for my base, I just have a water bottle that I cut the tube off of. Um, you want it to be probably about eight to 10 inches. So you could do that with a Gatorade bottle or a sports drink bottle, or even some larger water bottles. Uh, so I have this here. Um, another, uh, and I have kind of like a splay of everyday household items. Uh, on my base here, I have a brown paper bag. And now where the brown paper bag comes in is that if you do not have natural weeds, you can actually use this brown paper bag to make your tubes or tunnels for nesting material. Now, how we do that is, thank you so much. Uh, 
is that I can just take a marker. Um, now, while uh, solitary bees, uh, like the mason bee and like the wheat cutter bee, they're not too fussy or they're not too, uh, uh, you know, strict or rigid about where they nest in, but there are preferences. Just like us, every creature has a preference. So one preference uh, for the mason bee in general is that uh, the, the diameter of their tube or reed is going to be about eight millimeters long. Um, so if you have kind of a washable marker, that will go around there. It might be a little bit longer than that, but it will work. So to make my tunnel from these everyday household items, I am just going to grab a marker, grab my uh, brown paper bag, um, and then just start rolling. And now the great thing about using uh, this brown paper bag material is that while this model may not be made to last um, or, you know, is not, I mean, maybe use season two tops um after you're done with this material you can compost it so it's not nothing is going to waste here so once you have a nice reed wrapped around your marker you're just going to take a piece of tape and i can hold it up there too so i have my brown paper bag wrapped around a marker i have my piece of tape I'm just going to put it right along the seam there to make it nice and tight. And then poke my marker out. I might have made it a little too tight. Put my marker out. Up. Oh. <laughs> or you can decap the marker. That also may happen too sometimes. But what we're going to do is we're going to be smart about it and use that to push it through. Or I also have another marker to keep moving on in this demonstration. Yeah, so folks, um, when you're wrapping that, you want to be, uh, we're going to learn from that mistake. And we're not going to wrap the, uh, the brown paper bag around that marker too tight. So we do have another one. So we'll try again. And again, these are just things that, um, this idea of incremental installation that you can even try in your backyard if you have the area or the ability to do so or that you can throw up for your first time uh, in doing a Mason Bee Hotel in your local garden. Um, and the great thing about that is we'll talk about transferring the cocoons or the, uh, the pupa um, when they're actually in that state uh, once we move on. All right, success. So we have our first read. Um, so again, it might be a little bit big, but this is still uh, accessible or viable for a mason bee to set their, uh, to actually tunnel in and lay their eggs in. Um, another item that I have here is just a paper, or I'm sorry, a toilet paper roll. Now, the reason I have this is that the key thing to having or when creating your mason bee structure is that everything is compact and tight in there so that you don't want anything wiggling around. So I may not have two with me, but because we're going to use other materials, but by placing a paper, a toilet paper roll in there, you can actually kind of help create that compactness. If I had two, it would kind of just, uh, it would squish together and nothing, it would, it wouldn't allow anything to move. Now, one thing I do want to point out here is the length of the toilet paper roll compared to the bottle. Uh, like I said before, you want to make sure that everything in there is going to be weather protected. So the lip of your structure should overseed um, or go over the uh, the actual tunneling or the, the nesting materials that you're placing in there. So um, as a ratio, again, in general, I would have all of this a little bit longer, but as a ratio, this is a really great protective lip or barrier. Um, and that goes out about uh, one and a half to two inches uh, further than the nesting material. So I have my um, I have my paper towel or my toilet paper roll in there. And you can also do that with uh, paper towel rolls. Um, you might need a couple more because they tend to be a little bit slimmer uh, in diameter, but uh, you can and you could do multiple of them. So that way you're making sure everything is as, as compact and tight as needed. Um, now the next thing, oh, that's my marker one. Uh, so like I said earlier, is that if a mason bee sees an opening in both sides of a tube, they will not nest there. So one quick and easy way to close this off is I have a bucket of mud. 
also sourced from your garden, so nothing's going to waste. Um, now the mud or material that you want to use when creating or capping off your tunnel is definitely more of like a clay-like mud. This will, one is uh, a substance or material that the mason bee prefers, especially when creating the cells within their nesting tunnel um, for their eggs. Uh, so this is, again, definitely more so for demonstrative purposes. Uh, but with this, and it's a little hard to see, but what I'm doing um, with the mud in here is I'm just taking my reed down there scooping it into some mud and then dragging it up the side to make sure that it's going to be nice and compact so that it's really capping it off and so that way the, the uh, bottom part there is still a little cool. and again there's that wind in new york city <laughs> so i'm just going to go ahead and grab my material really quick and some of this is excess bags All right, so we're just going to tuck this under this, uh, this bin here. So we're going back to that initial read is that we can see, now this is some uh, really nice, just uh, uh, some, some soil from the garden. But what's important is that this is entirely closed off. So that way there's no light coming in and that it screams safety and security for the uh, mother, um, the mother solitary bee, or in this case, a mason bee that would be creating her nest there. So we're just going to put that on in. And we're not going to finish this house uh, for this exercise, but definitely just wanted to demonstrate some uh, techniques and ways to build. Um, and the differences or how the different ways in which you can build a bee hotel. The next thing I have with me is a reed. Now, these are the natural materials that solitary bees are going to nest in, whether they be uh, what I have here specifically is the reed from Phragmites. Um, in our area, Phragmites is a very competitive plant that may um, outcompete uh, grasses that we really are hoping to grow in our salt marsh areas or in our riparian zones uh, like cord grass. So what um, I actually sourced this from uh, Central Park Conservatory when they were doing their yearly removal of this grass. And what I love about this is that an air or an issue in one area, you know, Phragmites uh, out competing cord grass can become a, a solution or a resource in another area by providing a home for a solitary bee. So what I did in, in another great thing about this is so if we look at um, the actual Phragmite itself, it has these nodes um, or segments in the actual reed. So uh, while this side is open, the bottom side where the node is, is closed off. So I don't even have to worry about capping that one. So it's kind of like a natural capping system for, or capping for my uh, tunnel reed for, for my uh, nesting reed for it. So I can just go ahead and stick that on in. But again, I do have a couple that are a little open, just like that guy. Uh, or my apologies, just like this uh, piece of reed here. So I'm just gonna stick it in the mud, make sure it is nice and nice and compact. And again, whenever you're doing that soil capping, you wanna make sure your soil is nice and clay-like. That is what's going to attract uh, the mason bees once they're actually building their, or when they're coming out and emerging and then building their nesting tunnels as well, uh, is a nice thick clay soil because it's stickier, um, it's easier to work with. And when the mason bees are taking it back in chunks and mixing it with, you know, whether it's leaf cuttings as well or, or plant cuttings and their saliva, it's a really great, um, it's a really great, well, masonry material. Uh, and that's kind of where uh, mason bees get their name from is, is the, uh, the employees are the um, methods that they employ in their nest making. Uh, just like a masonry working with um, materials or clay or uh, 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 clay to build a home or a structure, mason bees will work with more clay-like soil to build their nesting materials. So I have a couple in here. And again, um, this is going to be that first intro uh, uh, mason bee house. So you can fill this up or what we could do is we could just fill their reeds um, all around here and kind of just make this compact. And normally we would cut more. Uh, things that you can use in cutting is I have a, just a great pair of garden shears uh, and that was able to, or that allowed me to kind of cut the nodes or the reed where I had wanted it to. 
So what you would do ideally is you would fill this, um, you would fill this water bottle until it was completely compact and there was nothing moving around. And uh, you would make sure, while this one is, you know, a bit too long, because like we said, we want to make sure that there is a lip of protection um, uh, so that way nothing is sticking out and nothing is exposed to the elements. You would make sure that's nice and tight. And we can roll a couple more, um, we can roll a couple more reeds. Something, uh, another material that I brought, like I said, different bees have different preferences. So you can even use a pen to make a nesting reed for something more like a leaf cutter bee, uh, which is going to want a smaller nesting reed there. So just like that marker, you're going to get it around the pen and just roll it. Uh, the more length of paper that you have, um, the more durable that nesting reed will be. So like you saw, I didn't just have it go around one time or two times on that pen or material. I was making sure that it was nice and thick so that way it can sustain some work. And like it was said earlier, this is just going to be, you know, kind of like that piloting housing structure. So um, after this, I really wouldn't, I probably wouldn't use this for more than one season um, just to kind of see how it goes. And that one, it's a lot easier when that, uh, when that pen is out. But yeah, so you have another, and you could actually tape that off so that it's all like a little flush. You don't want too much, uh, too much going out. Yeah, so you can see that this one is a lot thinner or is smaller in, di uh, in diameter and would be, um, a different choice for one of our nesting bees. Now, uh, solitary bees, they are, uh, they're pretty uh, welcoming from one another. While they may not uh, have one singular hive, they will nest near uh, one another. So a mason bee can nest in the same hotel as a leaf cutter bee. Um, they do have different cycles and different practices uh, in different preferences, but they are, they're, more than welcoming of, of uh, or not more than welcoming, but they are uh, tolerant and um, can be seen nesting in one area. So after this is, um, we're going to imagine that we have compact or completely filled this tube. Um, we would, we could string some, we could either uh, tie string around it to make a nice little saddle and then hang it from somewhere, but we would place it. Um, but before we talk about placing, I think it's actually good if we go ahead and explore another style of uh, Mason B structure or Mason B hotel. Uh, again, if you are, you, you try this out and you have success and you wanna uh, up your your management or one your, also your capacity of Mason bees that you can hold, there are multiple other um, structures, stylings. You can also still make your own by just having a woodchuck that is, you know, uh, six, uh, and you can uh, attach that to another posting, uh, but a woodchuck that is, you know, six to eight inches in length, attach that to a post, and then just take a drill uh, that you may have in your home or at your garden and drill your own holes into it. I will say that method is a little bit harder um, because with these, uh, one great thing about having the reeds or just having these uh, cardboard pieces is that um, at the end of the season, once the cocoons, once the eggs are laid and they've pupated or they're uh, pupating, you can take apart this reed structure and then actually remove the cocoons from the reed and winterize them or store them over winter in a, a way that's, um, you know, protecting them from predators or mites or any other things that they have to worry about. Uh, but before we go into that, I think we should look at another bee house or bee hotel structure. So we'll come on over this way. Like I said, there is a wonderful uh, Mason Bee uh, hotel structure here posted. Um, and before we're actually going to take out one of the blocks or a different way to house them. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to note the positioning of it. So when you are posting or placing your Mason B, uh, your Mason B structure, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is the location, uh, and with or a couple elements about the location. One is the sun. So Mason bees, they wake up in the early morning hours, and they really want that warmth of the sunlight or early morning sun. So when you're placing it, you want to have it the front part, the front box of it, facing to the south 
southeast, um, but to the south. So that way it's getting that early morning warmth. And then in the afternoon hours, uh, it'll actually catch the afternoon shade so that the pupa and the eggs won't be overheated uh, while they're hanging out or while they're developing in the, uh, the Mason Bee uh, Hotel. Another thing is the height of it. This is a really great height. Um, you want to have it at about four uh, to six feet off of the ground. And so this is at just about uh, a little over six feet. I'm five eight, so based on off of that. Um, so this is wonderful. This is going to keep any predators from climbing up in there and uh, removing the eggs uh, before they actually have a chance to develop and before you can remove them if you choose to do so. Um, another thing to consider is uh, once you have, uh, once you have your, your mason bee eggs, and they, or once you have your cocoons, um, you know, they were eggs, they've pupated, they're cocoons, you're removing them, um, is where you have it in the springtime, once they're actually emerging and once the mating is happening. Um, so a funny story about that is my friend, she actually keeps mason bees, and uh, where she originally placed it was kind of like she has a very open garage, like a two-way garage door, and she figured it was really nice and convenient to put it on the side of her garage. Um, Cause you know, she wasn't really worried about them being aggressive or, you know, stinging people, and it would just be easy to maintain. And it got the most sunlight. So it hit all, it checked all the boxes for the height, the sun, um, and the actual, uh, the safety of the box. Well, come springtime, once the uh, males and female bees, uh, mason bees are emerging, um, what she did not account for was the fact of their mating. Um, mason bees, they don't travel far from their nest. They only go about uh, 300 feet or 100 yards. Um, so when you have their, their nesting box or their emergence box, um, which we'll get to, uh, the emergence box is where they are stored in through the winter or where, um, they're, and my apologies, where they're stored in uh, as you're readying yourself to release them into the wild or come springtime once they're starting to emerge so that they can continue their life cycle, you want to have that emergence box near the, uh, the desired nesting area. So if you have that within 50 feet or so, um, but she had her emergence box, she had the, the nest itself or the hotel itself on the garage. And then for a couple weeks or so, she just had mate and bees like all around the garage floor or outside the garage door. Um, so you just have to be very careful of because they'll, they'll kind of drop and mate wherever um, is, is suitable or wherever they meet their, their mate at. So all of that is to say, uh, you definitely want to keep in mind where you're actually placing your box. So that way it's kind of out of an area that will be walked around by a lot of people or it's not as heavily trafficked, um, but it's also in an area that's going to get a lot of sun and that is high up off of the ground. Um, so when looking at this box, uh, again, we can see that it has a really nice depth to it. Um, that's going to be about eight inches or so. So those reeds inside are going to be great. Um, now some boxes have can have a fixed uh a fixed block in there or just a fixed nesting system uh but the great thing about this is that it does not so this is going to make maintaining the mason bee uh the mason bee sh structuring a little easier Oops. slide it on out and so this is a bee block Oh, hey, we actually have some mason bees here. So we're going to put them on back on in. Some inside, too. Yeah, perfect. Oh, there are three bees. Yeah, so, well, these actually are oh, so nice. So um, we're going to go over, uh, we're going to go nice and quick so we're not disturbing them too much. Um, uh, one of them fell perfect. down. Yeah, I did see it's that. So we're going to make sure that we get them back on in. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, so so these are uh, these are going. Um, but the great thing about this B block is that it has layers to it, so that way you can clean out this um, this tunneling system. Because again, we want to make sure that we're creating a habitat where we're attracting mason bees or solitary bees too. But we also want to make sure that we're caring for them. Um, common threats to uh, uh, solitary bees are going to be um, parasitic wasps that will lay. Um, their eggs in there and that can actually uh that will end up um ultimately killing the developing pupas or the developing adults in there um as well as termites mites in general 
Um, so we want to make sure that we're able to clean these materials. By having a B block like this, you can just remove it layer by layer and, um, you know, scrub out and make sure that you're getting uh, also the waste that is naturally going to be created by the mason bees or by the solitary bees. Um, again, uh, this can, especially you can see the variance or some variance in size. Uh, so this would attract leaf cutter bees as well as mason bees. And again, we can see some of them uh, just kind of getting used to, you know, being up and awake. Um, so speaking of that, um, the how the, the cells are actually structured is that there might be five to six, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, six to, to eight uh, eggs per tunnel. And um, how the female or how the mother, uh, you know, goes about laying her eggs is that the back cell or the back tunnel will typically have female bees and the front will have males because the male uh the male solitary bees do emerge a few days earlier um and like most bees their main function is to breed so they'll emerge a few days earlier get food get supplies and then hang out near the emergence box waiting for the females to come out so that they may mate and then Unfortunately, or well, not unfortunately, just by their cycle, they uh, they do pass or they do die a few days after successfully mating. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna carefully put this back on in there. And then later on, we're gonna go ahead and make sure that we get our um, other other uh, mason bee that was hanging out there. So nice, let me see that one more time. Um, and then that's, <laughs> we had an unfortunate, but a, a prime example of we, uh, uh, an insect that was not intended for this home actually just uh, crawling out of this uh, nesting tunnel and flying off. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, actually we, and we have a nice visual aid of the maintenance that really goes into keeping mason bees uh, year round. Um, but before we do that, we're going to open up and see if we have any questions about some of the structures that you can use when keeping mason there's, bees. There's a bee on top that you're going to squish. Oh, so it looks like there, I thought there was enough space for it. Uh, no, it has it, on, on the one in back. Oh, inside? Is there enough space? Yeah, so it looks like, uh, especially they, they, do, uh, they do move down. So what we're going to do is we, we're making sure that we're at the bottom there. And then we're going to go nice and slow and gentle-like. So that way oh, they will fall and adjust. There we go. And they will return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the, the warmth of the sun got them going, yeah. Nice, and yeah, and they'll come on back there. So uh, we'll move back right, to yeah. our table. Yeah, they were flutter, uh, uh, buzzing about. So we'll move back to our table um, and talk about some of, or see if there are any questions about the different uh, housing structures. Um, yeah, especially Ashley, when comparing. Yes. We do have a couple questions about the different structures. Yeah, um, of course. One of them, it sounds like you're about to get to, so you just correct me. Um, do you clean out the box after the season o is over or when? Yeah, so absolutely. And that's going to, we're going to have a nice visual aid for like that uh, goes over the timeline of the mason bee and some of the chores that you have to do. Because um, again, uh, a great reason to keep mason bees is how low maintenance they are. Um, so for the, and there are different ways to go about it. Um, but for a, a, a system like that, what I would recommend, especially here where it gets a little cold or our, our winters can fluctuate um, a bit so, uh, is um, winterizing them. So you could have two sets of that block that we just saw there, um, or even with the, uh, the low cost, um, down the uh the pilot system that we uh kind of first constructed um is having two sets of materials one so that way you are protecting against any mites parasites or any other insects that are burrowing their way into the nesting tunnels um and so you're keeping them clean uh when you actually clean them you can use a bleach solution but you would clean them after you remove the pupas or the cocoons um you go into that and we'll actually just start referencing or actually i'll ask first um if there is a question um that does not uh, include the cleaning of it because we're going to transition into that uh that is about the um the different structures or even how you can find uh, uh how you can acquire or build your own mason bee houses or hotels yes um do bees mind if their nesting site is swinging around on the end of a string <laughs> um uh so 
yes. So that's why um, if you had something that is like the, uh, the, the structure of the prototype that we built there, that you kind of have it nestled against a tree or fence um, especially if you have a lot of the wire fencing, you can kind of squeeze that bottle in there so that way it's safe. Um, just like how you have an extended lip to protect it against the elements, you also want to make sure you're protecting that foundation or that structure against the elements. So thank you. That's a very good question. Um, someone also asked if they can buy a bee hotel anywhere. Uh, yes, you. Uh, so there are a couple of different websites um, that you can uh, uh, look into. Um, one is Beekeeper, and you can buy motels for relatively cheap. Uh, you can get them anywhere from seventeen dollars uh, up to about thirty-five. It really depends on the size and the uh, complexity of the the motel that you are looking into. Um, there are also kits that you can buy, which includes. Um, cleaning materials, uh, winterizing materials, the, the motel or hotel itself. And um, some of them may include uh, cocoons. Um, however, you can, you, know, you can include that or not. You can attract the, the native bees that are in your area, as well as working with local groups to uh, source your, your uh, solitary bee cocoons. Great, thank you. Um, and then we had a question that I think I'll save to the end about carpenter bees, unless you want to take that now. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, we could take that now. Okay, so there's one garden that has carpenter bees that started to nest in the woodshed, and they wanted to know if they could make a, make a nest for them to attract them and then close up the holes in the shed. So to me, that sounds as if, as if we're trying to kind of trap the carpenter bees or using the hollows from the carpenter bees to attract mason bees. Um, so carpenter bees, uh, they, yeah, they, they are fundamentally different. Uh, carpenter bees will actively chew out um, uh, and can damage some structures. Well, they'll chew out um, holes or cavities to uh, live and nest in, while mason bees will uh, are naturally drawn to already hollowed out reeds. So that's why we kind of like have those uh, nesting tunnels that we create for them. Um, if you're asking to use abandoned carpenter bee tunnels for mason bees, it really depends on the size and placement of them. Um, so I think the question is more, can they make a new nest that will attract the carpenter bees enough to get them away from the shed? Oh, okay, thank you so much. Um, that, that I actually, I don't know. I imagine if you had, uh, again, materials that are going to be attractive to them, uh, like if you just had some, like a, a <laughs> it might look a bit odd, but if you had a, a large posting, uh, just like a four by four or four by six, um, that looked, or even if you are doing any uh, forestry work or know anyone who's doing any pruning or anything like that, if you have a, a stump or a trunk, um, or you know, part of a chunk, uh, and just lift, left that in your yard. That could attract carpenter bees. Um, but yeah, it that that one sounds like a, a fun and tricky problem. Okay, I think that's that's all for now. Um, let's look at your life cycle. Perfect. Yeah. No. Thank you so much. So this is just a really quick rendition to kind of help talk about the, uh, the the chores that are needed to be done um, when keeping solitary bees. Now, by species, it will differ a little bit. This does focus on a mason bee's life cycle. Um, so we so we're going to start with emergence. Um, so depending on your region, depending on the species, uh, they will start emerging um, anywhere from uh, late March to uh, early April. So when they're emerging, you want to make sure that. Um, so, in, in one great uh, one great tool to uh, help calculate your emergence is that for a mason bees in this area, they will start to um, emerge once temperatures are steadily uh, are consistently staying at fifty five degrees. Um, they can go a little bit earlier, and sometimes again, it gets a little wonky if you have a cold shock. Um, but that's typically their emergence behavior pattern. Um, uh, when you, especially if you're having two separate containers, uh, so one, um, if you're winterizing them and you have them in a shed or a fridge or, you know, an outside container to protect them from the elements, you want to make sure that your emerging bees 
are going to be near the desired nesting area. So just like how we had that post up, uh, up above the ground, we would take our emergence box um, over near that post. Now, when you're helping them to emerge, and again, this is in the scenario where you are removing the cocoons and winterizing them or keeping them in a, a safe and stored place, which is which is preferred just to make sure that you are monitoring the um, the the viability as well as any threats that could be presented to the cocoons. Um, an emergence box can be, um, it's actually can be a very simple, a very simple setup. Uh, you can just have a nice cardboard box with a, um, that you would place your, your sleeping cocoons, uh, whether they're in a tin or whether they are in um, a mesh bag or a, a, a layered material, you, you would place that in this box with a nice uh, hole um, that's going to be about two by two inches and then cut that out and they will start to fly out and this will prevent them from trying to go back in to their original uh, nesting tunnels. So if you had something like the, the bead block that we were showing before that has the layered structures, um, you could just put that box inside of a, uh, inside of your emergence box, your cardboard box with a hole cut out of it and they would start to come from that area. Um, so you want to make sure that wherever they're emerging from is near the desired nest site. And you also want to make sure that wherever they're emerging from has plenty of early or early flowers or early blooms. Uh, so flowers that you can ensure that are in that area, um, something like wild geranium, uh, clover, uh, you could use for Cynthia, um, anything that has an open flower and composite uh, composite leaves, as well as um, another great one, which we have around here and is considered in, uh, a weed, but is dead nettle or purple dead nettle. We have a lot of that around here and that will be a great food source um, as they are early blooms and um, will are vital to the, uh, the initial survival of our adults. So in the springtime, your main chore is just to make sure that you are, um, you're monitoring your uh you're monitoring your bees making sure that they're not trying to emerge too early and then getting them to your desired um your desired uh nesting site so yeah so this again this is springtime we have our bee going on over um again the the females will select a new nest uh the males will their main primary is achieved they've mated successfully with a female they are now uh they're their life cycle is now complete and our new female will select a nest. Now, again, her lifespan is a little short. So over the next four to six weeks, um, she's going to be creating uh, cells. So each reed, again, can have up to um, five, uh, five to eight cells within that reed. So in that in each individual cell will be a packet or collection of pollen that she has uh, received from nearby flowers um, or that it has received from nearby flowers and piling it up and then laying an egg. Uh, now females, they will, they'll mate with multiple males um, and so that way that uh, it's ensured that they can also uh, have multiple eggs. Um, so after she uh, piles up um, the pollen uh, or deposits pollen, um, lays an egg, they'll then wall each cell off with kind of a collection of that clay-like material of plant matter and of their uh, uh, saliva as an adhesive material that will then create the barrier or um, the, the, the base for a new cell. So she'll keep doing that over and over again. Um, at that point, uh, you really, you kind of just let the mason bee uh, do their thing or the solitary bee uh, do its thing. Leaf cutter bees, um, while mason bees will emerge uh, in the early spring, our leaf cutter bees, they're going to emerge in the summertime. Um, so that's why it's really important, which we'll talk about, is making sure that you have um, uh, multiple plantings or you kind of have staggered plantings of native flowers, um, well, ideally uh, native flowers that are going to provide uh, food and sustenance throughout the sp spring and in into the summer. Uh, so yeah, spring and summer, very low key. Um, you know, in the summertime, those eggs that were laid, they're going to hatch and you kind of have like a little larvae in there that is eating the stored pollen uh, that the uh, uh, mother um, mason bee in this situation put in there. Uh, but where we really come in and where our chore comes in, uh, which again, low maintenance only takes about 15 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on how many, uh, how many mason bees you have, 
is the winter time and winterizing our uh, mason bees. So a really great way to make sure that you are keeping their cocoons clean, that you're protecting them from any parasitic uh, uh, insects or wasps that might have uh, burrowed in or termites or beetles, depending on where you're at, is um, to actually take these reeds that have now um, a little pupating uh, mason bee by taking these reeds and scoring and opening them up to remove the cocoons. Um, so what you want to do is you want to inspect each individual cocoon. A cocoon is going to be like a nice darkish brown color. And for a visual aid, um, the uh, University of Oregon, or Oregon State University, my apologies, has a really great PDF on uh, what to look for when trying to determine the difference between uh, pollen and then a pollen mite or you know what the burrow hole of an, uh, a parasitic wasp or beetle looks like so that you really know or have an idea of what's coming into your area. Um, so again, uh, the university or Oregon State University has a really great PDF on that um, that will give you uh, visual references. Um, so you want to expect those cocoons and then you want to separate any cocoons that look a little bit questionable um, if they're not fully developed or they might have uh, a material on it that you're not sure is poop or if it might be a termite um, and you want to separate them. Um, and after you've separated your good cocoons to your uh, questionable ones, you can clean them in a solution uh, just to make sure that any parasites or uh, mites that you're not seeing are removed. Now that solution is going to be a one to 10, uh, one part bleach to 10 parts water. And then you kind of just give them a little bath. You can fill up a tub, put them in there, agitate them a little bit, and then dry them off and pat them gently with a paper towel. Um, so after you've cleaned them and discarded any uh, cocoons that might be harbor harboring uh, parasites or uh, you know, <laughs> threats, um, you're going to store them. Now, there are a couple different ways for you to store them. Um, one, my favorite way, is just having little sleeping bees in your fridge. Um, most commercial fridges, uh, they're not they're not made to store bees, but you can do it if you just do a little work throughout the summer, or I'm sorry, throughout the winter. Um, their ideal storing temperature, uh, especially for mason bees, is going to be um, anywhere from 36 degrees Fahrenheit to about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this will allow them to regulate their fat stores and uh, uh, stay throughout the winter or uh, um, pupate and sleep throughout the winter anywhere from, you know, ideally 90 to 120 days. Um, I'm sorry, 150 days. My apologies there. Uh, so if you're storing them in your refrigerator, uh, you could put them in a tube um, and you can have a sponge and you will dampen that sponge, but make sure it's wrung out so that way there's no uh, there's no cooling water in the bottom, um, but that it is going to keep the humidity in that container at about 60 to 70 percent, which is the ideal humidity levels. Um, so that's one way by storing it in the fridge. Um, there are also humidifiers, bee humidifiers that you can purchase. Um, but if you are in an area like New York where uh, the 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 weather's or I'm sorry, the temperature um, it doesn't get uh, below freezing too too often, you can also just store them outside or in a shed. Um, in this shed, you want you could put them in a coffee tin or just any kind of container and make sure, making sure that you are puncturing holes to uh, help airflow and to um, make sure that uh, while they're going to be protected from any large predators that might go in and try to eat some sleeping bees, um, they are going to be, are they gonna have the oxygen that's needed and uh, have that airflow there. So just by having a Maxwell coffee tin or you know even a, a larger Tupperware container, um, you can store your sleeping bees in your shed. Um, or you can just have them uh, in a container outside. Um, but the question earlier was about cleaning the nesting materials. So if you're removing them, especially from reeds like that, um, or uh, reeds like the one we had originally, you don't have to worry about cleaning it. You can just compost those materials, you're set. Um, but for the bee block that we saw, um, you would want to clean that with also another, um, you, you could use a scouring tool, like a small uh, uh, bottle brush, but you can use a solution that is again, one part's bleach to one part water. So that way it's uh, making sure that you're uh, scraping off um, scraping off any pollen or any uh, detritus that's left over um, and removing any potential small parasitic wasps that are hard to see or killing any small parasitic wasps that are hard to see. Um, so, you uh, you definitely want to clean your materials after you've removed the cocoons, um, or 
if you are doing a bead block that we saw earlier, you can have two sets. Um, so that way you can keep your uh, sleeping cocoons in that bead block and then just kind of in a box or in a tin over winter so that they're protected um, and have a new and clean, clean bee block available or nesting block available for them to uh, uh, naturally move towards once they actually start emerging again in the springtime. Um, so that is, again, it shows that the maintenance on them is very low key or it's, it's not heavily involved. Um, it just depends on the route that you go. You have a, a different meter to it. So especially for, you know, if you're piloting a, a, bee, a Mason Bee house um, or a Mason Bee hotel and uh, you're kind of doing like the initial setup of just like a water bottle, some reeds, some uh, uh, cardboard tubes that you're making from markers and pens, you can uh, store those, um, you know, in you could just store them in a mesh bag or in a container that has that's aerated with holes. Store it in your uh, store it in your your shed and see how it goes and see if you want to invest in the next summer and um or in, in the next season and have that incremental installation. Maybe next time you build a very uh, easy um kind of like a birdhouse, but a, a Mason Bee hotel, or maybe you buy that seventeen dollar bee hotel. Um, but that way you are adjusting to the level of your comfort. And so that way you're making sure that these living creatures that you are caring for will also be able to thrive. Um, so I know that uh, we kind of sped up there, uh, but do we have any questions kind of about the uh, maintenance schedule of, um, of mason bees? And uh, I know I said leaf cutter bees will, um, they will emerge later in the season, but if you're waiting to uh, winterize your bee cocoons um, until about uh, late October, mid-November, um, that would be safe to remove them from their nesting or to transition them into winterization as well um, so that you could do them all at the same time. Uh, so are there any questions about a maintenance schedule or the life cycle of solitary bees? Thank you so much, Ashley. That was so cool. That was such a great treat to get to uh, learn all about that. And I can't believe you got to see the, the mason bees like live and in person. That was very cool. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and information. Um, people are really enjoying the ice cream truck in the background behind you. <laughs> yeah, um, I would love to get a Mr. as well. Um, yes, you deserve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, uh, if I could say one last thing, um, uh, is that, you know, in 2008, there was a study published uh, that was a survey of bees in, uh, in Bronx in East Harlem. And they found a wide diversity of these insects and of these hard workers that are ensuring that your flowers, your gardens, the foods that we're eating are being pollinated. Um, and what they ended with, which I really appreciated, was that uh, this, this idea of that we have an assemblance of pollinators that provide a unique opportunity for educational and ecological benefits. And by keeping these hotels, these bee structures, these houses, whether it's in a bottle or in a house itself, you can be a part of the effort and the need and drive of creating a sustainable environment for these hard workers that work so hard for you. Awesome. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we are at one o'clock. There were no more questions about the life cycle. Someone did ask how to identify and remove the pupas, but I think you covered that and the PDF certainly does. I was able to find it and link to it in the chat. Um, oh, perfect. Okay. Do mason bees have particular plants that they prefer to pollinate? I have fruit trees, berries, and would like to encourage pollinators. Yeah. So it, it depends on the species of bee. Um, what you will find commonly throughout the, the throughout North America or throughout the United States are orchid bees, um, blue orchid mason bees. Uh, that's the first one that I was ever introduced to, and they are great for fruit trees. Um, that's actually that's their that species preference is uh, starting with fruit trees, and they actually go tree by tree so that you have full uh, pollination, which is fantastic. Um, and then other species, it 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 uh, it really depends on the species and their preference. Uh, but yes, that's an excellent question. Blue orchid mason bees are probably right up your alley. And can you buy blue orchid mason bees or would you, how would you attract those specifically? Or do they just appear because you have fruit trees and food that they like? Yeah, so you can um, work with uh, uh, local and some large scale, um, uh, large scale organizations. Uh, the Xerxes Society has really great um, links or resources into connecting you with 
uh, local um, meliotologists or local mason beekeepers um, that can help you, uh, that can that can provide uh, cocoons for you that are you know, um, certified to be clean and parasite free. Uh, but more than likely, um, you are you probably have some in your area. It's really about uh, providing the the environment for them to attract them to that. Uh, again, uh, mason bees. They don't fly too far. They'll only go about 300 feet or, again, 100 yards. Um, so it's about strategically placing multiple boxes, depending on the amount of land that you have. So that way, they, uh, uh, there's, there's an ample opportunity for them to nest. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll close things out. Um, and again, thank you so much for sharing all of this amazing info. Super fun. Um, we did have people tuning in from all over the country and someone asked, um, you know, mason bees, there's not just one kind of mason bee, right? There's like hundreds of different mason bees. So yeah. the ones that are native to the ones that are native to New York City, are those the same that would be found in the South or the Midwest? And would or, you know, is there any difference in how they would um, maintain their habitat or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are even, so even uh, the mason bee that we brought up before, uh, like the blue orchid mason bee, um, there are two subspecies of that that are kind of, that use the Rocky Mountains um, as a geological uh, uh, indicator of, uh, you know, what species they are. So yes, there are hundreds of um, uh, different species of mason bee. And it really, not only the species, but the area that you're in will determine some of their habits, especially when it comes to emerging um, and when it comes to uh, when you would want to winterize them. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, again, the Bee Project is a wonderful, or even the Xerxes Society, um, they have some great indicators of uh, geographical um, practices that you should follow. Uh, what we talked about here today um, is really great for the uh, Northwest, uh, uh, Midwest, um, and kind of like that Rust Belt area. Uh, but I imagine just like even with dragonflies, uh, somewhere uh, down in Florida, um, your timeline might differ just a little bit. Um, the practices of, you know, maintaining and cleaning and uh, the solutions, those will, those are important and those will stay, um, as well as, you know, the, uh, the, the productivity of the bee, um, but how you can best serve them will be informed by, uh, by resources of your local beekeeper, or uh, using Xerxes or using uh, a beekeeper um, for local information. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley, so much. Thank you, Ijendu and Elena for filming. Thank you, gardeners at Hope Street um, for hosting us today. We really appreciate it. Your bees look awesome. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today for Earth Week. And we're really excited um, to have been here with you. Green Thumb offers free workshops and webinars year round. They're all open to the public. While we're still virtual, they're open to anyone. Um, and so please do sign up on our website um, and we hope to see you again at future at future webinars. Thank you so much for coming.